So good morning everyone. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with everyone and share Dhamma. So just before beginning, it's lovely to pay respects in our own way for a couple of moments to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. I feel gratitude to have met the Buddha's teachings. I was at university and um, for many years, uh, around almost 30 years now, did a lot of sound meditation, practiced together with many people and had the wonderful opportunity of um, learning many ways of doing Dhamma investigation with Lance, who was very creative. So he gave uh, extremely good skills, not just to meditate, but also to investigate Dhamma, which I have always appreciated and really enjoyed and studied many texts, which normally couldn't have studied on them. So that's um, quite amazing. So around uh, 30 years ago, when uh, something changed in my life after all these years, um, wonderful practices, and this, um, there was a sort of uh, external circumstances which were changing. And uh, it made me rethink many things. Um, just before that, sometime before that, we had had a week's course on the Pachayas, you know, conditions, the 24 conditions. And it was such a rich teaching and so awesome because it was called the Ocean of Dhamma. And I really enjoyed that because it sort of showed all the ways and things just come and go. And it has this basic truth about it that we can't grasp any of the conditions. They come and they go. And in discussion with someone, I thought, you know, what can go hold on in dumb minds? So conditions are always perfect. That's all there is. It's what we do with them. We can't control them, but it's what we do with them where our choice is, you know, how we respond. And that's quite, uh, well, almost quite awesome as well. Uh, that is really quite a lot of uh, truth in that situation. How do I respond to things? So this change happening, what do I do? Um, I've been doing many things for years and, you know, how to um, find what to do next and look inside. So I thought it'd be nice to see this statue, the one that was presented to Queen Street. And it's really interesting that the posture is the Buddha teaching, the first teaching, where he's showing us with his gesture, the four qualities or re realities which leads towards the noble truth. And, uh, and that is really the main thing that when I was looking what to do, I thought I'd go and read the first sutta again. I decided to have a fresh look and uh, the aspects and also how the Buddha started coming to that realization. And the aspect that struck me was that he, he first had a wonderful life and then it's only when he realized that all those things are in a very deep way, um, part of his life too, about growing old and aging and death and all the grief that goes with it, that we sort of turn in around to see what to do. And that's, uh, really moving in the sense that uh, it's almost like a guide for us what to do. Um, the other thing around the same time I was reading these, uh, um, the, they're very sh short teachings of uh, by a Thai monk called Achandun Atula. He only says things in a few sentences and I love this quote which was connected to exactly a game the same um, things as the Buddha is saying in his uh, 
gestures and on the quote you can see that uh, he says the mind sent outside is the origination of suffering the result of the mind sent outside is suffering the mind seeing the mind is the path the result of the mind seeing the mind is the cessation of suffering it is said that he that's how he lived this was his one moment of how to do four noble truths moment to moment and that has a very strong instruction for me right that what i need to do is same thing as the buddha did by turning around to look inside not continue to look outside for a solution but look somewhere inside reading this sutta again and again the main thing is the buddha says really comprehend dukkha really get to know it and say how do you know it okay at that time there was quite a lot of the first arrow kind of dukkha you know the pain and things that come and the basic ground shifts in uh, in somebody's life so i was experiencing quite a lot of pain like that and how to deal with things in a new way um, and then there's another sort of way the buddha says about the second arrow that we can have a dukkha everybody has dukkha because that's part of life that's pain difficulty physical or emotional it's what we do with it again you know what we do with the conditions dukkha exists how do we do with it we can either shut it out as if nothing happened or we can make more of it and that's the second arrow you know have grief lamentations of um, sorrow despair and continuous sadness and so on or we have a choice to duck out of it somehow <laughs> and that choice is obviously the most attractive one because no use shutting it out it's a reality it happened and no use going on and making it more either and that's almost like a middle way as well not going to one extreme or the other uh, which is also part of the buddha's first teaching so it meant to duck out of this second arrow coming to us had to do something different had to uh, learn how to where the target was coming from and what to do it's almost where the cause of it is and what i should do so i hadn't realized those things too much by then but those thoughts were going on not having done anything about it and then also i was searching and looking for various ways as i said and discussing with uh, many good friends including bikhus the one bikhu who was just leaving um to go away on the way i was just saying you know if this always happening in life what do you think i should do and he says oh shall now is the time to put those realities of noble truth into your life and live with it and practice living it you uh, know how do i but i couldn't ask because it just stopped me how do i do that again it's the same thing so after stopping for a while and not doing anything but knowing something needs to be done um and having read the another sutta where the buddha says um he is describing someone his own a process of how he started uh set to enlightenment and we know the first part you know he sat to uh, found him decided to have a middle way and he then looked after his body physically washed himself fed ate some food and then he had this vision of going somewhere upstream differently to how things are normally flowing uh, to to find this truth and he in this story he's telling someone who isn't enlightened yet but he is just telling him the story and ananda's listening of course so that's why we know the story that um, when he had sat down uh, and set to practice and uh, mara came with all the beautiful daughters he turned uh, away from that desire to get involved with science and go inwards then he practiced his um, jhanas meditation with anapanasati when he re- 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 reached a secure place within himself still place uh, he then started re- reflecting on his life 
and he re recollected that how he was born. He was born because he wanted to be born and he had a mother and a father. So those are the conditions for our birth. We need parents to be born and we don't just decide we're going to be born and we're born. There needs to be a reason for it and the support for it and this great gratitude for the parents, for me, who allowed my birth to happen um, as a human being and to come into this life. Then after that, he says he was fed by Brewer, he remembered that, that we need nutrition. That's really a key part in our lives because once you're born, if you don't get nutrition, you will die. So that nutrition is important and it's not just nutrition for the body, it's also nutrition for the mind. So he recollected that he had he was brought up with nutrition. And then he recollected um, that it wasn't just this life, but that happened to him over and over again. And he had the skill to recollect his past lives. Or if you say, well, I don't believe in past lives, <laughs> you can just say recollect many different things that happened in your past up to now. How sometimes one way, born one way, and then that finishes, born and that finishes. And there's always a cause and an effect and a reason for it. And the pattern, he discovered this pattern that there's always a cause and there's always an effect for being born. Not just for him, he could recollect other beings' past lives. And that's when he says he realized um, how to practice the middle way. And uh, so that seemed really beautiful. So I decided, well, perhaps the best thing to do um, would be, you know, we have this amazing recollection um, practices in the Santa Chanting book. Um, so I looked at the Paticca Sangpada, the dependent arising uh, meditation. I decided to learn these uh, by heart, first of all. So in the chanting, in the Paticca Sampada, it, it says, Avijja Pacha Sankara, Sankara Pacha Vinyana, Vinyana Pacha Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa Pacha Salayatana, Salayatana Pacha Pasa, Pasa Pacha Vedana, Vedana Pacha Tanha, Tanha Pacha Upadana, Upadana Pacha Baba, Baba Pacha Jati. And then he says, Jati Pacha Jara, Marna, Soka, Paideva, Dukha, Dona, Sukha, Sambhavanti, Evange Dasa, Kiva Dasa, Dukha Kandasa, Samude Hoti. So all those long list of things is the second arrow qualities which cause and strengthen Dukkha. And then it says, Avijaya Tveva Asesa Viraga Niroda Sankara Niroda. Sankara Niroda, Vinyana Niroda, Vinyana Niroda, Namarupa Niroda, Namarupa Niroda, Salayatana Niroda, Salayatana Niroda, Vasa Niroda. I didn't learn the rest of it. So that's I decided I would learn that much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I learned it and just started, as well as doing some practice, doing this as a meditation practice because it says recollection. So I thought it meant that I keep saying it to myself to understand its meaning, to understand its flow, to get to know what it's, what it's saying to me. And um, there are so many ways of exploring this. Um, and with all the skills we'd learned about group Dhamma investigation, we can draw diagrams and we can um, find examples in our life, which I think most, most of us are familiar with. We can try and relate to things that happen. And the one thing that really interested me many years ago, we had a text where it, the Buddha's um, teachings, um, um, it says that um, how to investigate Dhamma and one of the things that really stood out for me is, says there's the word, and there's the meaning of that word. 
And then there is truth behind the meaning of that word. And then there's niruti, how to um, become skilled with it, I suppose, or put it into context or use it or so on. There's a very um, not easy to define word. Uh, so that uh, came up. And I thought, not just do I play with this um, chanting and learn it and meditate on it and just try and rest with it and see what came up. And of course, after some time, as some patterns began to come up. But the main thing also that helped me was looking at the meanings of the words themselves. Because, you know, one of the things is it's quite easy to find a word and its normal meaning, the usage meaning, if you like, and then get stuck on it and think that is the truth. That is what it means. Well, that's what I found. It still happens with even day-to-day -day words. You know, talking is very difficult. Because what we really want to express is hidden behind the word, isn't it? Um, so that truth, the, what, what he calls Dhamma with a small d, the quality, quality of something true, which we can't hold, because we can never hold these qualities, but they're expressing something. That this uh, Dhamma behind words, maybe a lot more, it encompasses something much deeper. So, for example, avicca is not just not uh, it's often translated ignorance avicca means not knowing ah in pali means not we don't have vicha we don't know something what don't we know don't know how things are don't know truth behind something and we don't know how suffering co is caused so that's avicca not knowing those four qualities ultimately the qualities which bring about suffering not knowing that things change. So which has all those things of not knowing something, which is actually obvious, but it's not easy to know because we don't have the tools maybe or for whatever reason. That sets off for us to go in a particular direction. So avijja goes towards um, when we don't know something, or even if we do know something, it goes towards what we do with it, the sankharas, the activities. Normally it's called relational formations. So I'll put that as a word. But um, what does it actually mean? That whatever, based on what I know or don't know, the behavior becomes, you know, the mind goes that way, sankhara. Uh, we start doing something with it. And that flow, then to do something, has to become a little bit conscious and activated with vinyana. Now, vinyana's function. It just says consciousness, but then there are three words for consciousness in Pali. There's mind, or there's chitta, or there's vinyana. So they are slightly different because of their function, because of the truth of what they represent. So vinyana, anything to do with jnana, is something to know, is what I think. Uh, so vinyana means knowing all around, or knowing in all directions, or knowing fully, is one meaning of it. And there must be many others. So those are the qualities that started emerging from this word of wanting to know. And there is this knowing, wanting to know. And wanting to know seems to lean on something. It causes, what do you know, mind and body, some physicality and materiality, nama rupa. Now, nama rupa are always together, uh, and mutually related with each other. And at first you think, oh, it's just a body or materiality. Okay, the four elements. Material body is made of you know, skin and bones and so on. But maybe something deeper about it that it's also not just, it's also changing. It's not just made of that. You know, it comes and goes because the attention goes towards that and the particular way of mind-body rises up. So if the sankara, the volitional activity is to do something as skillful, for example, the sort of mind that the consciousness that can will, will seek that, and the mind body gets activated because it's there. The qualities of mind, uh, there are four on there. There's Vasavegna, Sanya. And so uh, it has the um, quality of experiencing or sensing something and perceiving, Vedna and Sanya. Now, those two qualities are quite powerful. 
because they sort of stand out from the others. We either sense or feel something uh, and experience it to respond, or um, there's the quality of um, uh, labeling something. Now, at this point, they haven't become active. They are all potentials. So the mind body is there already. Um, and the, then you're doing it in it is also a little bit of chetana relation. And also, uh, the last one, as I say, sometimes it's called consciousness again, vinyana, and sometimes it's called manasika, what we make of it in the mind. So that, those mind qualities are ready. And to operate those, there needs to be a sense space, which is the next one, salayatna. Our sense spaces, again, haven't become active yet, but they are present in order to experience the outer world in many ways, as well as the inner world and thoughts. So there are six senses, not five. The five are for sensory things and the mental one for mind faculty for mental things. And of course, any of the senses are only sensing. They don't know. In order to know, it has also still to go through the mind. And then, then the next one is where the activity might begin. So con their function is to contact something, to be open to contact. They meet the uh, um, contest. So the eye, when there's light, contests light and responds. When there's sound, the ear responds. When there's taste, the tongue responds. And when there's touch, the body responds. Uh, when there's something touching. Uh, then when there is... Um, a scent or smell, the nose response. When there's a thought or a decision, there's a mind. So they're already in their potentials. And when contact happens, we have a choice to respond or not respond. And somebody gave this example more recently that, um, you know, this person's driving along and uh, um, they notice that he has to pay attention to where he's going. So that's the main focus. So most of the contact is with the road and what's going on in front and you know, making decisions. But certainly you notice he usually loves looking at cars, but this time can't pay attention to the details of the cars coming from the opposite direction. They're contacting the eye base, but not choosing to pay attention. Similarly, after all, I noticed it's not just the sound looking, also ears, you know, you could hear the sounds of these cars but again, could not follow it. So it's almost like at the point of contact, there is this choice whether to follow or not, what to allow contact to happen. Uh, sometimes there's this practice of guarding the senses and think, how is that? And it's all, maybe it's this, you know, that we are aware senses are going on. We don't have to choose to go to that. Um, so the when the choice is made, however, then, uh, then the next thing, the feeling or Vedana appears. And Vedana's function, as I say, is only to feel, it doesn't know. It's only to sense something. It, can, it does not know what is feeling, but there is either a sense of something good, or something not good, or neither. If it's a body touch, it can only be good or not good, pleasant or not pleasant. So again, can just be with it and leave it or go on. And if we want to go on, either like or dislike, that's craving, tanha. We thirst for this or not this, you know, want to choose. And that itself, having chosen, oh, because I chose, I want to keep it. And upadana means you know, we take it up and want to keep on having that whatever I enjoyed or did not enjoy, I want to keep on having that situation. So Upadana's function seems to be that it wants to um, keep gathering, keep heaping up, and uh, keeping, uh, heaping up um, then brings about uh, something else, that it becomes a habit, it becomes Nambhava. And when it becomes, we then become a particular way, and that's birth, you know, birth of a habit become stronger. But then something may hit us, and then there's the cup. Or when things are in the same way, that birth begins to disappear. If the way of habit is not useful anymore, or it ceases. And then there is this 
uh, difficulty, not knowing what to do. There's confusion, there's more suffering. And again, if you don't realize the truth about that, why is there suffering? It goes on to Avijja again. On the little writing, it says, on the Dukkha, it says, Jara Marna Soka Paideva Dukkha Dumna Supayasa, as in the chanting or recollection, which means decay, dying, tribulation, grief, sorrow, any kind of disease, distress, and despair. So that's all the qualities of the second arrow and um, letting that affect us. And then there's two other things. One is says forward order, which is on the left. And that is says when it's going round in the cyclic order, in the clockwise direction, then it is a sporting condition for. So when one thing arises, as I've just explained, then that it can, it can, and that's very important, go on to the next thing. And then it can on the next thing and so on. So if this is, then that becomes. The Buddha actually says it just like that. He doesn't give the names of things. We don't have to have the names of things. As long as we know, so if anyone who doesn't like too many words or names, all that is to know, to observe is, to notice when this is, then this becomes, that becomes. And the reverse is that it has sporting condition. When this has happened, it's because something else was. You know. When uh, realizing that, and as I said, we don't need the words, it's only noticing uh, either how things get carried forward or how we can look back on something. So if we didn't catch it while they're going forward, we can look back on it. And for me, that was, I used to have a lot of regret, a lot less now. <laughs> So, you know, it's like regret, think, oh, and then carry on regretting, and then the second arrow comes and carry on beating ourselves, thinking, you know, why did I do it? What should I have done? But it's already happened. So practicing this made me stop and realize, you can't do anything about it now. It has already happened. It's past. It's what's become. It's the result. We can do something with Or can look back to see how it happened, why it happened. And that in itself, I suppose, is one of a very practical fruit, a result of practicing this, this in this way for me. Um, the other thing I did with the opposites of things, you know, so that um, opposite volitional formations of sankaras is craving. So um, when there is craving, uh, it's, it's like tanha or craving. It, allows those uh, uh, sankharas or volitional form formations to become stronger. It adds up. Every time, every time there is craving, those things add up. And even though they come and go, the effect of it accumulates. So it's not like we are keeping the craving, because as I said, they are just words, but it's what's behind it. The, the effect of grasping something stays on. And it, it accumulates somewhere in a habitual way of being, which is also changing. Um, so another opposite, so I won't do all, but if you want to play around with it, you know, to make the diagram, you look at the ones directly opposite. So another one, uh, for example, exploring the very, not very active looking one, that Manama Rupa. What's opposite that? It's Bhava. You know, so it's something ready to be. be but it hasn't become yet, but it's ready to be. So the mind and body are there, the physicality, the potential to um, name things and activate things, but it hasn't become anything yet, but it's wanting to be, that makes it becoming. And so in this way, what is opposite Dukkha, which is for me, it was the most, the starting point, for exploring differently is the contact, you know. So that is why, you know, um, when we first studied many texts on dependent origination, they say, well, the first two are the past. So if we do it as a practice, they're not the moment to moment, of course. They don't say, the texts don't say, this is how I read it. Um, then you can cut the cycle off at the feeling point. Oh, I thought, 
after practicing with each link separately and together. You know, it's possible not just to cut off at any, at only one point, it's possible to cut off at any point. And that really was a strange thought because I, I hadn't read it anywhere. Maybe it does say so. Um, up to then, I hadn't read it anywhere. And I thought, maybe it's not true. Maybe it's wrong. Uh, but then uh, being open to, willing to change one aspect. So I call this, you know, all these thoughts, willingness to change. Because if I have willingness to change, I, it's not necessary to judge good or bad in a judgmental way or right or wrong, but this is how it is. So I have to be willing to accept that this is what I've discovered. Um, why, why is this is what I've discovered? You know, how come? Is it true or not? Uh, so I'm willing to sort of jump into it no matter, but with care, of course, with metta and kindness to oneself, not just in a blind way. So I kept on practicing and right in the middle of this whole cycle, I had to put asavas or outflows, we'll talk about them later. But I've also put dots from which are going towards asavas. Um, and that is just like an underpinning something, but I hadn't become aware of it at the time. So this has, I suppose five or six years later, all these things happened, you know, gradually. It's not uh, all at once, it's very step by step and many things in life, as we know, affect us. So those calmed down, the things that had started this process, got new ways of living. But um, I got to to Dalai Lama's talks when he used to come. And that year he was giving a talk on the dependent origination. <laughs> so, of course, um, doubly pleased. Uh, so I went to listen and at one point, about second day or something, he said this sentence which made my was really alert that we can, this process is backwards and forwards and it can be stopped anywhere. I thought, he didn't say it like that, you know, how he says it. And I thought, oh, that thought was okay, you know. It's like, um, that's the point of having a good friend, so Kalyana Mita Asra, the friendship, listening to something from someone who has some of these good in their heart. Uh, so that, uh, that must be true, you know, that we can stop it anyway. And why not? Because if something is flowing and we stop its effect, it will stop flowing. But if something is flowing, we notice it, then, you know, um, but we don't allow the effect to continue backwards, then that will also um, give no, no more power to the flow of it. So in, it was very interesting on the, uh, on the diagram for the um, explaining about this talk, I had put uh, cause and effect, and between them I had put a little symbol which goes uh, like an infinite, infinity notch backwards and forwards. But the effect, the knot is opened. So at that moment, the image was that this cause and effect can become like that, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, go to each other. And they can strengthen each other, like an eight-figure round. But if it's possible to undo either side, it can open. And that's a relief. Because it's true that no matter what, where we're at, we can choose not to go that way. Or if you've gone that way, we can choose how not to do that again. Not that I've been able to do it with everything, but it was a relief to know. Um, and just as uh, sometimes I were recollecting Dhamma, it says, Ehi pasiko open aiko like we see it in our experience as, as it is a hipasko. And once seeing, it leads on, hokanaiko, pachatan vedita, and so on. So a few days later, almost like having this something opened, um, there was an invitation for listening to a Dhamma talk. 
in um, the Sri Lanka monastery. And there was this forest monk from Sri Lanka, Mani Paputa Lakita. And somebody was translating for me because it was in Sinhalese. Uh, and uh, he was talking about how to practice cause and effect and cessation in daily life. Oh, that's brilliant. It's amazing. He added, um, I, I just thought there were these three things, you know, in, when we studied with last, there was another book in which, and also the suttas actually, the Buddha says, what I remembered before I listened to this talk, that there's um, three ways of practicing or list, investigating Dhamma, apart from looking at the words, that we listen to Dhamma and get some kind of jnana, sutta jnana. Jnana, as I said, means with jnana is knowing, or it's knowing in the sense of um, experiencing and knowing something to be true. We might not know what it is, but something reverberates. You probably experience it, you know, you know something is true. You don't know what it is. So through listening to something, sutta minyana, chinta minyana, then we play around with it, ponder with it, investigate it. And again, sometimes the knowings happen, but it might not complete. It's, it's a bit like, you know, we are, my image of this used to be that there's this uh, shape, you know, the rough diamond, and gradually we are smoothing the edges so that the knowing becomes whole and complete, so it can becomes clear without any edges. So anyway, a bit more knowing is going on, chinta minyana. And then the third aspect that was mentioned there was bhavna minyana. Practice it, put it into your life. Now this is always elusive. <laughs> I found <laughs> practicing sitting with my good practice or practicing, put it in the life practicing. Yes, there are many ways to try and practice it consciously in life, practice it in life. But it, it means living with it, bhavana, the word for practices, to be. How to be with it? Yeah. To, or as in the Paticca Samupada, bhava, to, to, to become something. So, and also actually, I, asked uh, a person the root of the word, and is it the same as such? Because I was worried, wondering why they're called four noble truths. And he said, such is the same root as is also to be. So how, how, how it is, you know, such a truth. So it's only one truth. Truth is how it is, but the quality is leading up to it. So I've started calling them four realities. Make that, make that whole, the noble truth. No, the completed one. And um, so this how to be or how, how, how to truly be what you are, uh, that, is, that is almost like a, a puzzle. Uh, it, it's not something that's possible to hold on to and explore um, at the time. So when this monk said um, five qualities, uh, oh, there are three. No, there are five. So the first one is Kalyana Mitasra, which she, we already know, you know, listening to, uh, needs someone so we can listen. So the reason we can listen is because someone is saying it or telling us. And that good friend, Kalyana Mitasra, support of a good friend, support of someone who knows something that they can say that's helpful. We listen. Or even someone saying something helpful, even if we don't know them. That is that sport, it's not the person, and then of course, the Buddha is the, the main teacher, the, the main Kalyanamita, in the sense that he said so many things, which is the sport. And then these qualities of Sutta Minyana getting something from having heard, investigating it, exploring it, Chinta Minyana, Bhama Minyana, and then he said, and we also need. Um, Yonisa Manaskara. Uh, often Yonisa Manaskara is translated as skillful attention. Breaking, you know, if, um, as you can see how, how I seem to work is 
if something is there said then you sort of take it apart first and then see how it's formed and then see if you want to form it again or form it differently or not form it at all but learn about it that deeper the meaning of it so yoni yeah, has many meanings one of which is the womb what happens in the womb something grows you know it's like the sport or the cause for something and manasikara is often translated as attention which is what it is but how we attend mana how we make kara is do something of it in my mind how i make of something in my mind from knowing where it came from that's quite a lot isn't it <laughs> that's what i thought every time knowing how to make something of my mind not know where it came from so almost always being keeping in the back of the mind this aspect of yoni so manasikara as a tool um after a while i listened to another teaching uh, same uh, practice in the forest monasteries as well in sri lanka and a lot of practices were based obviously on these five principles and uh, when he explained anapanasati so always being willing to be open to changing my view if you like or attitude what i'd done so many for years uh, he was explaining he of course talks sinhalese and pali i could answer a bit of pali but uh, not similar um, and there was people trying to interpret to their best but, but uh, this attitude of exploring um, the means of the words to say good sport uh, so listening to that anapanasati sutta he said the you know the first two sentences are about the verb is different it says pajamati see and the other one is all practice and then he explained what pajamati means how to practice pajamati um so pajamati uh, can have many um, practice aspects so just that first two stages of the 16 stages of anapanasati uh, so there's in breath there's out breath we know that but in breath happens the first one he said this in another sutta but i'm putting them together but um and reflecting and also what the buddha recollected remember that he was born um that um, before i'm born this this came to me recently this little thing as an experience that you know you're lying there for nine months it's a long time uh, not experiencing anything and just waiting and being in this suspended state and then both how complicated it is to be born <laughs> anyway this was a recent experience but uh, when we're born uh, the first thing that baby we did when we were baby um is breathe out yeah, you know because it was the last breath of the mother who was supporting the growth up to that point and the mother's last breath finishes and it's sort of done you know breathe out that and there's often a cry of the baby as the lungs open then the first breath goes in so really breathing in means life and start a new life so um that's quite a deep thing to notice that because it started it can also finish which is really the crux of what buddha's saying about anicca that whatever arises ceases so in that sentence is a great depth for me and um when the breath goes in it finishes as well it comes to an end and then a new breath goes out now it's not just breath going in out in out every, probably everybody knows that but what it's noticing that it actually finishes and then it goes out a new one and the breath isn't the breath not one breath then noticing 
what we began to see that this breathing is actually really four qualities those mahabhutas which are changing and coming and going in the rising season it's not a fixed oxygen bit coming in or breath going in um it's something continuously moving that's going and then different continuously moving stuff coming out um and these are four qualities of mahabhutas again what that meaning of that uh, rupa is in the cycle of dependent origination that the ultimate rupa the most subtle rupa the truth behind that world if you like are these four qualities we know these four qualities you know but we are protege of bio earth water fire air it's not just it's the quality of solidity the truth of something being a little bit solid immediately not staying but changing to some kind of fluidity some kind of heat or cold energy or some kind of um, cohesion or not some kind of movement um, so these qualities of cohesion movement flow energy are playing with each other all the time within each breath and when they enter the body now this is something interesting um it says they uh, the breath is going in and there's blood flowing in our body which carries nutrition from the food we've eaten and the food we've eaten has a potential for energy and this breath goes in contacts that and heat and energy are released um so heat is that element of tejo when so called and energy is called shakti which has different quality so the heat and that's released gets carried towards the heart where the hot warm and cold blood meet you know the venous and arterial blood if you like and uh, when something meets it causes vial movement and these vials go and look after different functions in the body as six or one you know it and to get quite long but these functions are also mentioned again we got we did as the dhamma work many years ago these six winds they are called there and their functions of looking after the body and helping digestion and repairing things in the body letting go of stuff that's not needed uh, you know the movements in the body and life the heat and cold and then also stuff that's not needed then gets carried towards the lungs and the outbreath happens is entirely different from the in-breath in many ways because its function is different to get rid of stuff that's not needed so this whole practice and then a new fresh in-breath happens so this this is all the meaning of that word pajanati so this is almost like the aspect of chintamaya pajnana now we understand or know something through reflecting and exploring it um and the that aspect seems really deep and I think to myself how am i supposed to do this in breath and notice all those things so he said when you sit to practice forget all that <laughs> because the jnana or knowing of it will help, will be effective it will have an effect we don't need to carry all that as well like an extra burden you know the thoughts connected with it because chinta minanas a lot of them are thoughts on the movements going on thinking pondering so on we don't need to carry them we can just leave them the baggage but they were helpful they were very useful and now we leave it the jnana from there is there we don't have to even carry that and just sit in practice um the final aspect which i'll share uh was um diga and rasa so the first are about diga and the next one rasa so diga can mean long but then his ex- example is you're going up a hill and you're taking this diga breaths and so sometimes the breaths are short but they are deep ah diga can mean also you know deep so i think well diga maybe it means effortful you know making more energy needs requires more energy rasa in this one you relaxing with soft breath little effort happy and so on so, ah, okay so so those are many different jnanas coming from those chintamani uh, sorry you know, pajanati 
in the first two sections. And then it goes on to in the, in the sutta, the next number three, sort of just, uh, you know, calming the bodily sensation, calming the mental sensation, breathes in and out. And it, well, it means, do you make it calm? No, as we sit and practice, our mind becomes calm in relation to all those activities. And uh, then we become aware of the touching, you know, the breath is going in and out, and so on. And it goes deeply in the state of mind in the Anapanasati. Um, the sukha is experienced, it says, and then uh, settling uh, the, the state of the mind is experienced, which is where I think jhana uh, factors can come, but also hindrances. When they settle, then the jhanas come, which is like the, for me the third section of Anapanasati, where becoming aware of the state of mind itself, you know, by this got investigation or not, whether it's got peace or not. When it's got opaque, then it can be opened out, almost like completely open, perhaps a little, I don't know, he didn't discuss that, that's me just exploring it in relation to my practice. But the last section is quite important because there, instead of simply playing, then this jnana may be allowed, if you like, or more active, becoming more aware of the uh, anicca, you know, rising and ceasing, coming and going. Soon as you say the word anicca, all the other stuff may come, jnana from chintana jnana. And uh, recognize something about it. So if you look at that diagram, so as the cycle is going, I've reached a point where I was saying that, you know, we, we realize through this, in the ports, um, the last four, uh, verses of Anapanasati um, about Anicca and instead of thinking um, I wish I could carry on the Anicca is going on the breathing is going on and it will go on until it doesn't and there's not much you can do about it then because it has that nature that it goes in and out, in and out until it only goes out and uh, that happens when Ayu Shakti, a life force, has finished. Whatever, however long it's not going to happen, it cannot be controlled either. So that's like an anatta nature of things, not being able to control things. So these might not be obvious word realizations, but there's this realization of knowing something has its own nature. And when that, a person can accept that, something is had its own nature so the green bit is the normal cycle going round and round the light green with the red words so there's you can see avidya sankara vinyana not knowing doing something about it consciousness nama rupa then salayatna fasa vedna tanha upadana bhava jati dukkha but the dukkha then doesn't go on to a picture. See, it turns round. Turns round because through that heart's knowledge of truth, which I prefer the translation, sadha, sort of not faith, but faith in the sense, trust or confidence in that process of what has been known, sadha comes and that starts the base or the foundation for the new uh, reverse cycle if you like and uh, because Dukkha is now known fully like in the first reality the Buddha gives instruction in the first sutta how to practice with Dukkha he says know it fully fully comprehend it you're turning around and because the all the energy that was going into Dukkha and making it go down is released and there's a fresh uh, relief and gladness. Um, and uh, with that gladness, without grasping anything, there's pamocha. Pamocha is gladness. Beginnings of joy, baby joy. <laughs> and uh, um, I'll put the squiggles, if you like, those, you know, they're touching it. So from the kite was released to sata, but not wanting to hold on or grasping and becoming being born, you go on, that fresh energy that would have gone into birth, 
goes to gladness. From the gladness, being glad, you feel at ease and is free. And there's an exuberant, joyful kind of vitality. Instead of going to Baba, to being something, it does not. And this joyful vitality, piti, they say that piti's function is to transform something. We need energy to change, don't we? So what we're doing with the energy, although it's not mentioned here, the, the word uh, vayama, effort or energy, it is what's the fuel behind the whole process, behind our life, because when we were born, it gives us life and energy. Um, I forgot to say actually, the function of energy in that explanation in the Pajanati was uh, explained as is the energy that's for the mind. So the first, the heat and so on are looking after the five physical bases, uh, you know, the body bases. And the energy looks after the mind. And you say, where's the mind? Um, it's not in the brain, it's not in the heart. That's what the Buddha said. Uh, when he was asked, he didn't say that, but he didn't say it's in the mind, the brain, he didn't say it's in the heart. When the Buddha Kita said, mind is wherever your attention goes. And he said, now think of where you were born. Well, the moment to think of it, it's there. The mind has already gone there, quicker than the speed of uh, lightning. So that Shakti, the energy from each breath, supports the life of mind as well. So at that point, the energization we're talking about, the energy that came from everywhere, is Shakti is working with the transformational effect in Piti. And uh, Piti transforms to become not anything in particular, not for heaping up any things, Upadana, um, and not for not heaping up either, because it doesn't just give up and just goes into joyfulness, but it changes and tranquil in a balanced way with the help of tranquility or pasadi. So pasadi doesn't want to heap up, it just wants to allow the energy to be balanced and do its function. And there's a serenity because there's no pull or push involved in heaping up anything. When there's no pull or push involved, it can be content. There's no thirst, no tanha. And the thirst is, has been satisfied. And there is contentment or happiness, which is the quality of sukha. And uh, when there's contentment and happiness, it's possible to not be pulled or pushed by any of the Vedanas, the feelings. So there's a unification based on upekha, the finest sort of a balanced equipoise kind of feeling or sense, sense of balance. And this produces samadhi, which has unification and inner strength or steadfastness and so on, those qualities. Up to here, the cycles for me seems very different because we've again reached that point of fasa, the contact in the world, which is opposite dukkha. You know, it's like halfway through, if you like. Because if we notice, to get to know dukkha, the quality of dhamma vichaya, investigation of dhamma, was quite necessary and working how to play with dhamma, chintamanyana, and also sati how to pay attention and what to, Sati's function is to keep in touch with what we're doing, as well as amongst other things. In, um, you know, when uh, King Melinda's questions, uh, King Melinda asks Nagasena to give a simile for Sati. He says, you see that earth, earthen ball floating on the river, on the water. When it is going on the water, it's always in touch with it, isn't it? That's like Sati. It's in touch with what we're doing at that time. So its function is not to drift away, keeping to the track or keeping that sense of direction going. So we can not focus on it, but we keep it in our mind as a sense of direction of exploring. Those allowed the faith, sadha, confidence to come, the trust. And pahamoja, piti, pasadi, sukha, samadhi, upeka. You may recognize that these are the seven bojangas. 
and they were all fulfilling their function. So at that time, the, the qualities of awakening are becoming mature to go towards fulfilling their complete function at the moment of enlightenment. This is, so I started by talking about the anicca aspect of um, Anapanasati, but that was just an example. For someone, for, for someone who is not yet ready for enlightenment, these qualities are continuously maturing and they can come and go in individually, is how I understand it. But for someone who is ready to turn to something different completely, these qualities have matured and come together. When they come together, that's the highest form of energy, if you like, when it's not wasted on anything else. And it's going only towards complete awakening. Um, they're working in harmony uh, with each other. So the samadhi is quite unshakable and firm because also the faculties, faith, energy, mindfulness, confidence, mindfulness, wisdom, uh, are all uh, fulfilled their function and they've become powers, nibalas. So the words are the same but they have, be, they have become unshakable. So everything is quite firm and ready. And in that readiness, there's readiness to be different. How? It's almost like the vision is going to change because the Buddha says, Chakru Udapadi, Nyana Udapadi. His vision changed. He saw something differently in the first sutta. And in this transcendental cycle, you can see Nyana Dasana. So it is seeing and knowing something or having a vision which is different from before. And uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, as, as if instead of seeing only a few degrees, you know, a limited view of something, there's a 360 degrees vision of all around everywhere. The experience to know and see all around and how everything is interconnected with each other. Seeing the conditioned, conditioned nature of things. The interconnectedness could be another word for conditions. We are all interconnected to each other. We condition each other in one sense or the other. But at that time, Jnana Dasna, there's a knowing of it somewhere through that experience of standing firm and not being pushed by anything. And when there's this realization that there is everywhere conditions and we can't do anything about them. We don't get enchanted with what things, the effect of those conditions are, how life, normal life might be to continue doing, to continue being in the same way. So there's a nibida, a turning where the senses are purified. There's no need for the five to do anything much. The mind, whose function it is, just to allow, to advert, the mind adverts differently. At this point, I remembered that when I first started learning Abhidhamma, um, in the thought process to describe that, um, uh, the, you know, if, you're dis if your sense is disturbed, first the contact happens and the base is awakened up, punch the varavachana, then, you know, that sense, you know, if it's hearing, or that sense gets activated. And then the mind adverts to it in order to know it. And this is in all consciousnesses, in all states, all active states of consciousness as well. Um, the function of this mind though is not to act at all, only to know. And it has very few qualities. It has vitaka, you know, it has uh, contact, feeling, perception. Um, the energy to carry on and uh, then do more life and so on and jivitinja, what you make of in your mind it has the seven universals and three other qualities of vitaka which are paying attention and then energy and it doesn't have chanda in it it's only very simple, clear kind of consciousness and what's important about it is is that it's only functional it doesn't carry anything with it it doesn't make a decision. It 
only knows everything exactly as it is. That's his function. So the Salayatnas, the five of them, are not active. So the Jnana Dasna, the mind is free to know as it is, is what I thought. And then the action comes after that, disenchantment, next jitta. Then um, all this body, mind, materiality, and everything that can be done with that, you see it for it is, how it can be complex and be conditioned and get caught like a spider in a web. You don't want to be caught in a web anymore. The web is there, you don't want to be caught in it. Get disenchanted with it and turn away. And turning away means that that vinyana um, now it doesn't seek the other four things and let's go um, of that um, seeking uh, the volitional activities no more need to do stuff um, so there is freedom they say that at that point um, in, in some of the explanations of the suttas that vimuti means that the there is the moment when one turns away from the mundane or lokya to the super mundane or transcendental, but hasn't done so yet, but there's the freedom to do it. Yeah. So it doesn't have to go towards doing anything in the normal direction. And it doesn't even touch in my diagram, from what I understood from the suttas, it doesn't touch avijja anymore, because you already know. So it doesn't have to go back to it. It's already beginning to know. What does it know? It knows that thing that was in the middle of that diagram. I said, I'll explain later. Asavas. And these asavas uh, are really wanting to be and not wanting to be. So it's the wanting to be, not wanting to be. It knows the nature of these asavas. And therefore it becomes vijja. And in the chant, the first sutta, which I obviously was what the Buddha started with, and all the rest seem to explain in many ways how to practice those things. He says, Chakruda Padi, Nyana Udapadi, Panya Udapadi, there's wisdom, Vijja Udapadi. So there's no Avicca anymore, there's only Vijja. And the next word is Aloko Udapadi, means there's just brightness, means the asavas are destroyed. So the next moment is called Asava Karanyana. First is just as Asava Kaya, the Asavas are destroyed. Then there's Jnana, knowing about it, knowing they have been destroyed. And he knows it has been done. So that's, that's quite a lot. <laughs> I was reading a Chanchal book and he says, you don't have to know all these details, <laughs> which is true. We don't have to know them. <laughs> and I like knowing them because it helps me to reflect. But also, it's, it's almost like a measure, not to measure good or bad, but it's almost recognizing something. <laughs> he says, he gave a really interesting example. He says, it's like when you climb on top of a tree and the branch breaks and you fall down, and you know it hurts. <laughs> so you don't have to know too much. You just know it hurts. It might be very simple for him. <laughs> but I thought, well, if I take it a bit further, and I'm climbing on the top of the tree, and the branch breaks, I try and hold some of the branches and get to know before I fall off the ground. <laughs> anyway, that was his example. And it is really true that we don't need to think, oh, there are too many words here. What do I do? What do I think? We don't need to know them because all this is supposed to happen in an instant anyway. But why does it, the Buddha explain them then? You know, I think, <laughs> well, for people who are not ready to completely know, I think it's really helpful for me, for who have that nature as well, to investigate. Because everybody has different natures. <laughs> so it's for me really helpful to know what's possible. But also, if it's not final enlightenment or that moment of eightfold path opening up, uh, these little things we experience, don't we, as little examples in our life, when a change happens, small changes. One of the things when I was exploring about this, um, Vinyana consciousness and, and, and these aspects I've just mentioned about, you know, it doesn't even have to heap up anymore. I thought I'd explain what I mean. Because first of all, in the opposites, 
exploration. Vinana is opposite upadana, which is heaping up. Upadana means heaping up the five khandas, which are supposed to be. And the Buddha says no five khandas. Khandas are, you probably all know, the other rupa, vedna, sanya, sankara, vinyana. And the point is in five. So rupa, physicality, the sense of feeling, uh, being an ability to feel. Uh, sanya, uh, to know and label and call it something or recognize it. And sankara, uh, preparation to do something with it. So, uh, and then vinyana consciousness. And I was exploring all this in the first cycle as well as this, for, at first in the first cycle, and this image came, and exploring the khandas as cause and effect as well. Because each one is a sport for the next one, and the next one exists because of the other one. So you can apply this principle, this, that, to almost everything I find now. So, I don't know if I can, you can see this clearly, but I was playing with my hand like this, five, because there are five of them. And I thought, yes, this is like consciousness, and it always wants to know something, so it goes, yes, you know. So if it's going along, we can't hold anything, and then it's holding something. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's just always turning to know, to know, to know. So instead of wanting to be like this, it always wants to do something. And it's almost like it's because its nature is to know, and it goes towards knowing. At that point, I thought, many years later, <laughs> when this separation comes along, it's almost as if, you know, it doesn't wish to know. It, it knows it can know, but it doesn't go that way. It changes direction. So it's like that now. They are, they are, they are still there. We don't die. There's no one that's still there. But it doesn't seek that way. It just goes. So it is free to go, to go where, whatever there is. And that's like from worldly to look to look utra, you know, somewhere different. That is not conditioned. That's the difference. Up to here, even all these beautiful qualities, the bojangas and so on, they are all conditions, aren't they? They are not qualities in themselves we can hold, but they are allowing something to happen. So they are all conditions. You can't grasp onto them and think, okay, I'm in a state of pasadi, that's the bojanga. It's not. The Buddha said, bhavita bahulikita. Practice it again and again, many times. But it doesn't mean take it. So we practice it for what? To mature them so that they can perform the function of awakening. Up to that point, the samadhi point, there are no more bojangas after that. All these other things are happening. Yama, Dasna, Nipita, Viraga, Vimuti. And then Asavas. And that, that Asavas is like a key. Very recently, you know, in this lockdown situation, you know, when going for a walk, some, because just walking is not walking to anywhere. It's almost like walking practice sometimes. Uh, it's not walking to somewhere, walking to get something or anything. It's just walking. And coming back and walking. I just chose this field instead of walking long paths and just walk around over and over again and uh, reflect or not. And one day I thought, oh, after many years, like this is about 10 years later, I'm doing that first sort of Patija Samapada practice. Uh, I thought, just, um, I just started recollecting cycle again, you know, Avijja Pachya Sankara, Sankara Pachya Vinyana. And I reached the point of going backwards, avijja, and I knew it has to be niroda, because it's the niroda cycle, I couldn't remember the next three words. And I have so long, I'd, I'd learned it, realized something, but I couldn't actually remember. A few years ago, I used to remember so many things, and once I started forgetting, and I said, good, now you know the meaning of it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I knew the meaning of it, but I couldn't remember the word. So when I got back, I thought I'd look up the word. And of course it says, avijaya tveva asesa viraga. Sankara and Rodo. It's not avijja which becomes niroda. It's together with the craving that avijja becomes avijja. Because you, there's the knowing and the realization about craving, the panya, the wisdom about the nature of craving to become and not become. Viraga means do not, we go away separate from it. 
from raga. Oh, it's just so beautiful, isn't it? Because it means we just didn't know, and what the deepest thing we didn't know is is the is the how we are holding on that counts towards a lot of what happens next. And sometimes people in many texts say, "Oh, you just have to learn to let go." Now, how do you let go? And that's always the question: How? How do I let go? So, you know, at, at first I used to think, okay, you can only let go if you hold on. So if I want to let go of these classes, I have to hold them first and then let go. But that's not letting what it means either, because it doesn't, that's an extreme. You drop it and they might break. Right? So it doesn't mean hold tight. It doesn't mean let go to drop it. It means have this willingness to change how I'm holding it. It's the how of it. You know, so not holding it with raga, but just holding it without that raga. So it doesn't mean at enlightenment everything just dissolves. It's just how we hold with the grasping, with the volitions and the sankharas that drop away and the heaping up because we hold. Hold to keep. So it's not hold to keep, it's just letting it because you know it's the holding that causes the suffering. It's how we hold, sorry, that causes the suffering. But we can't live with nothing. So we have something, we touch it, but we don't have to hold it. And saying it sounds a lot, but of course, you know, as you know, describing an experience is very difficult. And it sounds like very theoretical with so many words, but it's, it's, a, it's realizing how to um, even hold a view. So, for example, if somebody says, Oh, we'll do something, I would say, Fix it, you know, in the moment. Hold it so tightly. So, I have a perception of something and see something. Sonia, fix it. Then, that decision, that fixing, that perception, or what somebody said, the perception of it, how we heard it, um, go over and over again, and that perception becomes a decision. The decision becomes a view, and before you know it, it becomes richaditi, fixed view. So really, I started thinking perceptions are like baby views, just like nanas are baby knowings, <laughs> perceptions, and they are rematuring these things. You know? Don't allow those perceptions to grow. Just let them be perceptions. Is what I said to myself. So that was all these I'm sharing because they are all results of that changing attitude in some way and I can't always do it either but from time to time it's possible to do with various things in life uh, even with speaking there's one other thing i, I so we stopped that um, cycle because i think another thing we're doing all the time another maturing that's going on would be the eightfold path so in another sutta the buddha's um, explaining how to developed this eightfold path. It's called the Samaditi Devaitri Sutra in Midland Sayings. This time he doesn't start with the uh, recollecting the dependent origination first. He starts by saying, look, look at what's good, what's not so good, and good and bad in my life, skillful, not skillful, kusla, kusla. Then the next section's about uh, Foods, ahara, feeding. How do we feed the good or the bad? Mm. And that reminds me of this, uh, another really good recollections in the book about the boy's questions. Uh, it's called, um, this young boy was asked 10 questions because at a very young age she's enlightened and everybody didn't find it possible to believe. So he was asked 10 very simple questions. What is one? What is two? What is three? He says, what is one? One is all beings subsist by nutrient, ahara. That means we all need nutrition. And remember the Buddha's story that he recollected he needed nutrition. So in the sutta, obviously, that's what comes next. <laughs> that that's needed. It's not just body denutrition. 
because the four, there are four foods, if you look at the house in detail. There's the physical food, there's contacts, there's mana sanjeta, mind, volitional activity, and vinyana consciousness. So again, there are these aspects of um, the physical food and a very subtle physicality, which is this food for the senses, you know, how we feed our senses, our ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. How do we feed them? What do we allow ourselves to get involved with? What senses, fossils, contexts do I allow to come in, follow and not follow? So the nutrition is very important for that. Physical and mental nutrition. Then the next one is, how do we feed contacts? I already described the example, you know, we can choose what we choose to contact because that produces those two kandas of Vedana and Sanya. If we experience that contact either through feeling or through recognizing, so those two qualities are there. And Vedana and Sanya, we can see, we can also release them by cause and effect with each other. There are conditions for each other as well. Just having perceived, we don't might not want to leave it. Manasanjetna, what we do with it in the mind, the next food, you know, our activity, our behavior, our engagement or use of energy. And then consciousness, whether we want to continue with it or not, that consciousness of it. So again, there are these four or five, if you like, if you break the, you know, which are the five khandas again? So even the, this young boy, he asked about this meditation about uh, the four foods, which is a very practical thing, you know, what am I putting in? And putting into these very subtle qualities, what am I putting in? There's another person who explains this as a way of meditating, embodying it. Here, what am I putting in something deeper? And something deeper and deeper still that I don't even know, that's consciousness. So becoming conscious of what I don't even know. Uh, it's interesting experimenting with just being more attention to the back, doing matter practice or breathing or any practice or just sitting. That immediately the awareness, you know, if you suddenly become aware of your back and straighten it a bit, see, and it happens. Something we didn't know might come in. So these are very practical things about use of um, cause and effect in life, I think. I started calling this living practice uh, because my question always had been, how do you put it in your life? And then the sitting practice, and they're both important. So if we didn't sit to integrate or to make that ground firm, it's not easy. But if we only lived and didn't sit, so, so they're both, they're all practice really. The whole of life becomes practice. And that's, I started talking about this because they say that, you know, when in that reverse transcendental cycle, uh, after Mumuti, there's Asava Kaina, no? knowing about letting go of those Asavas and destruction of Asavas, if you like, destruction of their effect on us, their hold on us. They say in explanation that at that point is when the eight factors of the path have become completely mature and they become summer. So up to that point, they can come individually, you know, we can practice improving the view and purifying our view. We can practice um, how we might intend or think, sankapa, or uh, speak or behave, or, or um, uh, right livelihood is, um, uh, Sama Ajiva means, uh, Ajiva can mean earning a living, but earning a living how? We need a living to, uh, I think it's all based on gathering some energy to live, uh, to have a house to live, and to have clothes to wear, and so on, and food to eat. But what we live beyond, for beyond that, how much we want to expand the energy, and how much we want to use it to go somewhere further. It's our choice. So it may not be better or worse, depends on where we are in our life. Uh, but that right way of living, 
uh, or appropriate way of living, if you like, suitable way of living. Uh, in those moments of um, developing, they are coming singly, you know, you can focus on looking at one or uh, investigating a second one, like in the precepts and so on, is the middle three, also the speech and action. But really behind the speech and action are, is a mind, isn't it? So that's why they're called ten courses of karma, because behind anything we might say or do, there needs to be a decision to do or say. And how we make it, it's mind. So that's mind body again. So that that decision allows purification of those those three qualities of speaking, doing, and living. And then we've already said this sati, mindfulness, and so on. So those are gradually getting stronger. And maybe they can come two or three at a time together. But when the asas are destroyed, they all become mature for you somehow. And they all come together and they mature because there's no inequality in them now. So they can all work harmoniously together to go towards stream entry. So at that, that's not the end of Lukutra, it's like the phase in between, between Vimutti and the destruction of asas. So that it's possible to cross the stream, to go towards Nibbana, which obviously there's no experience with. But what's necessary, I suppose, for me is to know that what I'm doing right now, these little steps for each of these factors, is gathering up to do something different. And that in itself is how it's possible to um, continue with practicing. Uh, it has a result and it goes towards a result. Uh, even though it may not fully get that result, yeah. it's maturing towards it and brings more peace and more ease, uh, less inner chatter and so on. Uh, and I'm sure you've all got your own experiences of um, how your practice has helped you. So maybe um, uh, we can... Um, share any experiences or thoughts or things you want clarifying or discussing. It's not something that the whole cycle we need to know it. I think the principle is the important thing which we can take away that always to have that tool of looking how I'm making up something in mind in relation to where it came from. And having good friends to share with and check out with. It seems such a complicated subject. We are really trying to uh, dissect something which is not there. We ourselves, there is no self. We are creating ourselves. It's so complicated to me. We are trying to understand birth, existence, rebirth. We are going round and round in circles. We don't find an answer. Anapanasati is another thing um, which is, I don't, I haven't understood even though I'm trying to practice it. And there when he said about the nutrition and all these things and giving the energy, it seems at that stage, the energy is the thing that is creating mind. And it's the mind that is causing all the complications in the cycle of existence and trying to get out as well of life situation. So this is, <laughs> this is my confusion. Really, I don't think there's any answer to it. I, I don't know whether anybody can do it except Buddha. <laughs> I, I don't think the sense of mind is creating it. Mind just is. Ajahn Chah says that when mind is bright, Buddha said, when we are born, there's Prabhasra Chitta, the mind is bright. And then it gets clouded over. Ajahn Chah says, mind is just resting there peacefully. And then, you know, when we begin to take it out, and like Ajahn Tu's that quotation, when we begin to send it out to do stuff in various ways, with an intention, with wanting to heap something, that's the conditions when it, it gets conditioned 
And we are conditioning the mind by the way we send it out, is how I understand it. Not Mind is not the problem, because we couldn't live without it. It's necessary. Also, anatta doesn't mean no self to me. It means not wanting to have control over stuff. You know, we need a self to do this practice. We need to look after this body and mind. The Buddha said, I was born, I was fed with nutrition, you know, food, and so on, because we need it. So it's not actually not wanting it, it's looking after it, nourishing it. For what? Nourishing it to give us the energy to do this work, if that's what we've chosen to do, as well as live. Because living is part of the story. We can't experience the unconditioned without knowing conditioned. I think that's the whole beauty to me of this cycle of dependent arising. In order to know how to be free, we have to know how we are caught. So the conditioned world is our teacher, you know, the forward cycle of dependent arising is why I am the way I am. To know it and to explore it is how the atta, the self, might be growing stronger because upadana, the khandas, those how I'm, I'm heaping up things make the khandas stronger. <clears throat> we are born, when we are born, it says in the suttas, we don't have five khandas, we have five upadana khandas. What we have grasped is where we are at. So it doesn't mean born, just baby birth right now when I'm born in this moment, well, all I heaped up before is part of my ground for being how I am right now. And those, what I've grasped will make me how I am right now. So it's stopping grasping that the khandas are, are just purified to live and to do what's necessary, but not by what I want to bring about. And I think that through understanding the anicca and dukkha is the only starting point, not try to understand anatta. It's not an understanding, I think. I think it's realizing that holding on to do some way is what atta is being fed on. And it's not holding on, not having control, not wanting to control, sorry, is anatta. What we do have control over is we have a choice to choose what we want to do. Once choosing to hold on to what we've chosen is also a problem because it becomes a fixed view as well. So the willingness to change is why I put that as a title because there needs to be a willingness, not a willfulness, to make things go a particular way. To do something, to see how it goes, you know. And yes, as I said before and during the talk, that we don't have to know all the details. For me, they're helpful as tools, but they may not be helpful to everyone. And the second thing is we don't have to know all of them. The one that reverberates most with ourselves is the one to choose. I gave lots of examples because for me, that one that reverberated was this complex one of dependent arising. But now, seeing that we can see this effect of things <clears throat> and the reason behind it and how it can cause the next thing, and that's it. Don't have to know any of those words, only the meaning of it, you know, the, the level of the word, the meaning and the truth behind it. So we don't have to know the first two, only the truth of it. And the truth of it is, this happens, there's a reason for it. Do I want to keep it happening or not? Wanting to keep happening, wanting to go the same way would be what creates. Not wanting also creates. It destroys something unnecessarily because we don't know which way to go. But just doing without wanting to create or not create, but doing what is the next step to do, 
It's very hard to do. <laughs> it's easy to say, but it is possible. You know, <laughs> Ajahn Chah sums it up by saying, everything is uncertain. You know, uh, you say to ask him something, he said, it's not certain. It's uncertain. <gasps> How can you live like that? Then I thought, well, it's not because it's, it's uncertain and so you don't do it, or you do, do it because you're afraid and get fear. It's uncertain, but it's possible. So we do it because it's possible and see what happens. So in some ways, the whole of this could be said in just that <laughs> bit. <laughs> but for everyone listening, maybe one bit, it seemed, oh, yes, I can understand, work with the sankharas maybe, or with the foods. So or for me, that was really practical more recently when I was getting less away from these 12 words, you know, or 13 words. And, you know, the five things. So just using a hand as an example. It can have a lot of teaching in it. We don't have to have the words at all. Do you know what I mean? Does it help? Anyway, yeah, 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 yeah that's good. So you said a little bit about just some, um, thinking of practicalities for my life. I can think of using some of these in a reflective way and then also wondering about how to use some of this in the moment, so both aspects. And you said at one point, when this is, so let's say this condition yeah. or this thing that's happened, yeah. then that becomes. Mm. And you also said, or looking at it a different way, okay, when this has happened, it's because something else was. Yes. And you also said um, that when you were looking at something, you might take it apart and see how it is. And you also sort of said, well, you might see if you can put it back together in order to know it better in that way. So you might take it apart and put it back together to better understand something as it is. Um, and so I seem to find it easier to imagine the taking apart or the knowing that this has happened because something else was. I seem to find that easier than mm. the, well, this is so, then this will become. Or I, I'm wondering about how to, for example, know in the moment how to act and also how to reflect on those things later. So I, I suppose in the moment, I'm thinking more of like Hiri on a tapper, you know, trying to rein me in. You yes. Know? Um, whereas, I suppose that's not quite what you're saying in terms of if you wanted to look at perhaps a repeated behaviour you have that you want to work with. How, okay. how could you make more recommendations? <laughs> what you said is, in fact, you know, those in, said in another sutta, the thing start with kusla and the kusla, which are hiri and otapa, really. Because in um, Samit Gaya, when there's explanation of how to develop the path, the first sentence is looking after the guardians of our world, Hiri and uh, uh, Conscience, which means having a conscience and knowing there will be consequences of how I be. Those are guardians of the world. Which world? This, this world, inner world. This world that human, I am, the human being. And in some ways, that's similar if, if I look at this lens of cause and effect, you know, because there's this knowing or understanding, you have a conscience, because if you, if you don't, if I don't behave according to what I know to be the best way at the time, then the conscience won't let, it's like a guide from something true, isn't it? And... Uh, the fear of consequences are, is often translated as, you know, knowing, the, knowing karma in a way, knowing consequences of things. Um, then that uh, is almost like knowing the first sentence you said about, this is how it is, it can be. In fact, it, it, it's, it's uh, summed up by the Buddha like that, it wasn't me saying it. I said, it is a Pali sentence which I won't repeat, but when this is, then that is, you know, this, that, 
it's simultaneous really, but in order to see it, we separate. So when I would take it apart, we take it apart with no. We don't have to put it together though. I didn't, don't think I said that, but maybe. We can use it by putting it together, but we don't have to. Once I know something, we can't unknow. We know it. I've known it by knowing this and that happen and how they are related. So that's how to put them together. You know, how they affect each other. And the next sentence, the reverse order it says, and in fact, when the Buddha's practicing this for the first time, he doesn't start with a vichar. If you read the sutta, he starts with the last one, where we're at the decay, because right now he notices things are changing. Every moment I'm growing older, there's decay and death present in each breath. Why is there decay and death, he says? Oh, because I was born. Why was I born? Wanted to be. Why wanted to be? Huh? Because of heaping up Upadana. Why? Because there was a thirst for something. Because of how I felt. Because there was contact with something. Because there was the six sense spaces were there to do that contact with. And there's the mind and body which base for that. And because there's consciousness. One Buddha, Vipassi Buddha, didn't go further back, he just turned around from there. So consciousness turns around in itself and he realized it straight away, the forward cycle, if you like, how it happens up to coming to birth and death. But this Buddha, and so this Buddha tells the story of that other Buddha. But this Buddha, he, um, the Buddha that we are more aware of, um, then why is consciousness becoming? Because there was this evolution of activities in the past and it wants to find a route somewhere to know more because we don't know yet. Then it turns around from a picture. You know? So the, the knowing in this present moment for each of the times the Buddha's described it always starts from the now, the present moment, going back and looking back on it. So, you know, we do this exercise of recollection practice, sort of. From now back to the beginning. When we recollect practice, not from the beginning to now. It's now to the beginning to see how something changed. If you want to recollect something of our life or pattern in our life, you can recollect the thread of something and know how it came about that I'm now in this situation. So similarly with hindrances, actually in a very practical way, in, in not just in meditation practice, they are obviously in life too. They're not hindrances in one sense. They are obstacles because we don't know something. And really, actually, I think they're pointing to something we don't know. <laughs> they're pointing to a picture, how desire comes about. You know, a lot of hindrance of that has been there. It's pointing to something to look inside where desire is coming from. If the fatigue or resistance is coming from, which is often translated as hatred, but it's not strong hatred necessarily, it's shutting down something, then we have a reason why. And hindrances can teach us a lot in recollection practice. Similarly with the other hindrances, you know. So the word hindrance, nivarana, are things that come in the way to take us maybe back towards what we don't know. But they're also, in some ways, you know those friends which are very irritating, but they tell you something that's true. <laughs> they are telling us something to know. So that's another way of practicing it in this moment. You know, becoming aware of this hindrance or obstacle or something that stopped me or done something which wasn't a good effect and where it came from. And certainly in practice, they can come even more from a deeper place, I find. You know. So that very useful as a continuation of practice, sitting practice, to do this recollection practice. On good as well, it's not so, because these aren't good or bad anyway. Nothing is good or bad, it's what we make of it that's good or bad. <laughs> it is just a quality which is showing us something that's true. It itself is nothing, you know. Happiness isn't necessarily happiness, just a description of the quality, as is sadness. One isn't better than the other. They are simply qualities. But if we hold on to do be happy, 
that's grasping happiness, or what I think of it. Or there's a little uh, present moment to moment of how even I am interacting with somebody else, or how even interacting with myself in thinking, you know. But it's not in a pedantic way, of course. It's that middle way, a little bit at a time, step by step. That's how I understand it. Does it? Yes, thank you, Asha. Tasse Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambuddhas Namu Tasse Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambuddhas Namu Tasse Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambuddhas Namu